Good afternoon, good morning. You are welcome to this event, the Align MNH event, which is the launch today. My name is Mohan Somagwai. I am a researcher at the Human Sciences Research Council in South Africa, and I will be your moderator today. So you are welcome and please feel free to participate because today it's a very exciting day. It is exciting because we are going to hear a lot about this innovation that we're about to launch, Align MNH, and you will hear about also upcoming events that are exciting because they are new and they have been uh, paused for a while, but we realize that we need to have them to bring together this community. And we know that we have in different countries, a huge problem when it comes to maternal and newborn health. But among ourselves, we have experts, we have important stakeholders in this community of practice. We have members of communities where we come from. We have mothers who have their own experiences, but also have aspirations about the future. We're going to hear from all of them and all of them are going to share very interesting experiences and insights in terms of maternal and newborn health. So in terms of some housekeeping rules, we have a few. And perhaps the most important one is that of translation. We're going to have um, simultaneous translation from English to French to Portuguese and also to Spanish. So please participants who need to listen in using different languages please select the language that you will be using throughout the event. And the other thing that I would like to mention is the Q&A facility that you need to use if you want to communicate your questions, your comments during this event. Uh, please type in in that screen and we will do our best to respond to all the questions that will be posed and also we will try to respond to the comments as far as possible within the time that is allocated and you are all welcome to ask questions in whichever language you feel comfortable with. And please note finally, that the proceedings of this event will be recorded and the recorded materials will be made available to all audience members today. With that, I think we should get started. And I want to start with a very exciting uh, item for this program. And that will be a video. Can we watch that video, please? This video is going to show us what Align MNH is all about. So you are going to enjoy it because it's going to give us some 
background information. Thank you very much. Align MNH is a new initiative to create a space to celebrate maternal and newborn health successes, assess strategies, and address priority issues. Around the world, countries are working to save the lives of mothers and babies. Yet maternal newborn health work and the learning from this work is often siloed by region or by topic. Progress is only possible with collective action and building on expertise across and outside of established maternal newborn health communities. With 2030 rapidly approaching and with COVID-19 reversing hard-fought gains towards sustainable development goals, SDG targets, there is no time to waste. Led by a global steering committee, Align MNH will allow for more rapid and effective sharing of learning, evidence, and program experiences. It will ensure decision makers and program managers have access to the information they need in two ways. A knowledge heard, an easily accessible, user-friendly website, an interactive repository will put knowledge within easy reach for country tips. This multi-directional hub will facilitate more continuous virtual dissemination and exchange of evidence. An international conference series will promote the sharing of knowledge, experiences, and challenges. These regular, predictable events held online and in person will support dialogue and debate, create opportunities for mutual accountability, and drive informed action. Join us as we work to ensure that women and newborns receive the health care they need to live healthy and prosperous lives. Thank you. Um, I hope you enjoyed that video. Uh, I find it interesting, clear in terms of what Align MNH is all about. And as we can see, 10 years is not a long time. We need to get there. And we need to get there feeling stronger about the kind of health services that we provide for mothers and newborns. I don't want to waste time. I would like to welcome Nazim. Nazim is an artist. He is a prolific singer and songwriter. He's a guitarist, so you are going to have some fun. He has a way of communicating about peace, about resilience, about positive change. And he does this through music, through song. And he does this within communities and among young people. We welcome Nazim on the virtual stage. Nazim, please. Hello, everyone. Greetings from the sunshine. My name is Nazim, coming no, no, no. to live from the Smiling Coast. Yes. <laughs> How you doing? Coming at you live from the Smiling Coast of West Africa, the Gambia. <laughs> um, in my country, you know, um, a lot of um, women and their newborns are suffering needlessly, and I think that's really not necessary. We, we need to find a way to stop that, you know? So this song is dedicated to every woman and the newborn. Let's have a good time, all right? All right. Progress is still 
not enough, no. Mothers and newborn suffering, oh, needlessly. Weak economy and poverty and poor quality. But we are not alone in this challenge. We have got to align. A line for mothers and the new ones. We have got to align. A line for mothers and the new ones. This decade is a time for learning and time for sharing. Yeah, yeah. Collective action is the only way we can achieve this. We have got to align, align for mothers and the newborns. We have got to align, align for mothers and the newborn. We already know what we need to do. We have got to align, we have got to align, yeah, align for mothers and the newborns. The shining light on our community, yeah, yeah, for let's succeed and celebrate and share solutions. Let's accelerate the progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is more than just survival. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have got to align. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have got to align. Yeah, yeah. Align for mothers and the newborns. We have got to align, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nazim. <laughs> Thank you. That was good. <laughs> Uh, thank, thank you, you for such prayer in peace. <laughs> and now I'm going to introduce one of our key speakers today. And that is the Honorable Minister of Health in Ethiopia, Dr. Leah Tades. Dr. Leah? is an obstetrician and gynecologist and he she has been a minister of health not for a long time and it's exciting to have her today as one of the speakers she has long experience as a clinician as a leader in health she's an part of the academia also and she has also managed hospital programs, not only in Ethiopia, but also in the US. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Leah. You are welcome. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's honor, I'm honored to have the opportunity to address this uh, launch uh, this special launch of the Align MNH and I uh, would like to express my appreciation to the Align MNH steering committee members the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation USAID Japaigo and uh, esteemed speakers and all stakeholders interested in maternal and newborn health joining from around the world in this uh, session today 
And in spite of the challenge of the past and the present, uh, uh, the government of Ethiopia has always stood by women, mothers and their newborns. And for decades, this was the core of our health system focus and continues to be. As part of the sustainable development goal, we once again re-emphasize the importance of maternal and newborn health in Ethiopia and reaching all the goals related to that. And to that end, we've been working on our next five-year health sector transformation plan, which is a blueprint for, for our health system implementation, ensuring that it incorporated an enhanced focus on maternal and newborn health and aligning with the SDGs. As a result of this high level commitment and commitment of partners, we are confident that we will be on track uh, to meet uh, the ambitious goal of the SDGs. Because of the political commitment and increased health expenditure, improved access, and also because of improved education and economic status of women, the maternal and newborn health status has improved significantly in the past two decades in our country. However, we have still so many challenges and the years ahead, we we'll need to look at old and new problems in a new light and a heightened focus on effective and efficient execution of the plans. Integration of maternal and newborn health services requires collaboration with multiple sectors that must transcend the mere coming together for discussion to seeing through the services reaching every woman and newborn. And even with the progresses, we still have an acceptable number of women and newborns who die of preventable conditions. The progress achieved is also not equitably distributed in this vast country of more than 110 million population. There is significant differences in the health status between rural and urban the pastoralist and agrarian regions, the poor and the rich, and progress in improving neonatal health especially has been much slower. Moreover, even when services are available, utilization continues to be low. And lack of respectful care is another important pain uh, point in our health system. As the past few years have made it clear, improving access, especially to the disadvantaged community is crucial. And more, but more important also is improving the quality of services, employing better analytics to measure progress and focusing on transformation of the health system blocks. The country is trying to improve the quality of services rendered to its citizens. And I strongly believe Align MNH will play an important role in bringing together science, research, implementation experience, and policy making to stir our collective vision of stopping every single preventable days of women and newborns. We can do this if we come together, track progress across countries, and create opportunities to discuss and debate drivers of progress and key obstacles. In Ethiopia, while our success so far is a testament to a focus on context-specific solutions, we are keenly aware that partnerships and lessons from other countries are critical, especially around sustaining a comprehensive family health and integration of maternal and child health services with other relevant sectors that impact this achievement like the finance, education, agriculture and other relevant sectors. Moreover, the strengths of our health system prior to the pandemic and its resilience during the pandemic is ultimately measured by how well we care for women and children. We were one of the few countries also who, for example, managed a measles epidemic successfully with a national campaign covering close to 15 million children and ensuring continuity of immunization services with, during the pandemic. And we have made greater effort to limit barrier to accessing care at home or in health facilities using our primary health care units in this COVID uh, season. I'm sure many of you have, have observed similar resilience and innovations in the different health systems you work with and sh we should capitalize on those positive achievements as we embark on the next decade. Finally, I'm really delighted to be part of today's event and part of this 
the online uh, MNH and look forward to this dynamic partnership. And Ethiopia is committed to a collective action to accelerate progress for women and children. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. And for those encouraging words, I think your emphasis on collaborations, your emphasis on partnerships, and the importance of accessing care and health despite the context and very challenging context that we find ourselves, including now during the pandemic. Thank you for that. Now I would like to introduce two more speakers. Oh, yes, uh, these two individuals are our fearless chairpersons. They are co-chairs of the Align MNH Steering Committee and they are Dr. Queen Dube. Dr. Queen Dube is a consultant and pediatrician. She is also a clinical epidemiologist in Malawi and she is someone who has worked for WHO, for UNICEF, all in attempt to improve the care for newborn. And I'm welcoming her to give her talk now. Dr. Dube. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, exciting uh, moments in the year 2020. It's been a tough year with COVID uh, but some exciting news today. I'm going to just give a high level um, uh, presentation on accelerating reduction in maternal and neonatal deaths, uh, really focusing at the country level. Next slide. This global map, a lot of us have seen something similar for HIV, something similar for maternal deaths. The darker the green, the higher the burden. And if you look at the African map, most of Africa, except for South Africa and a few countries up north, actually has high neonatal mortality rates compared to the rest of Europe, the US, and most of Asia. So the darkest green, neonatal mortality rates above 35, the highest burden still remains in Africa. Next slide. And just to look back, because we're all here talking about the SDG targets, how we get to the desired maternal mortality rates and neonatal mortality rates. It's important that we remember that in high income countries on an annual basis are about 11 million deaths. Middle income countries is 35 million. But most of those countries where it's shaded dark green, that's where most of the beds are actually occurring. It's about 40 million uh, uh, beds. The, the goodness is most of these beds now are actually occurring in a facility. But the picture that you see in front of you, you see there are four lovely babies put in one court. And that's a reality in a lot of our African countries and some countries in Asia. What we shouldn't forget is the fact that in the 21st century, we still have 45 million women still delivering at home. And behind all these deliveries is the whole issue around the human workforce, the nurses, the doctors, the community health workers, that are so overstretched looking after these vulnerable small and sick newborns, working in dire circumstances where funding is not optimal, having been trained to do the right things but not having the capacity to be able to do it. And on a daily basis, babies actually die in their hands. Not just babies, but mothers also die in their hands. And that's a reality that we need to tackle. Next slide.
When we go down to the level of evidence, what is it that needs to be done? There are tons and tons of publication. And the interesting thing is the interventions that you, you know, worked for countries in Europe, the US from the 1950s, they remain the same effective interventions. Nothing much has really changed. We all know that if we invest in care during labor, around birth and in the first week of life, that gives you the maximum gains. We've known about this for the past decade or so. The issue has been how we implement, how we enable that health worker on the ground to be able to implement these interventions. And the time is now. And that's why for folks like me who are on the ground, looking after these mothers with their small and sick newborns on a daily basis, this is like light at the end of a very dark tunnel. Next slide. But the thing that really unsettles me is the fact that if we continue with the same trajectory, for Sub-Saharan Africa, it's gonna be 110 years for us to achieve the SDG target. And that unsettles me a lot. And I'm sure it unsettles most of us. 110 years for us to achieve the SDG target. When we talk about neonatal mortality rates, we're talking about neonatal mortality rates of under 12. And that calls for a different thinking altogether, thinking outside the box. How do we accelerate reduction in maternal and neonatal mortality? Otherwise, we'll get to 2030, it will be the same story. COVID has come, it's taught us huge lessons that we do need to build resilient systems. And so Align MNH gives us an opportunity to gather all our efforts together, gives an opportunity to that health worker on the ground to go to a platform where they can learn from other countries, go to a platform where they can ask questions. How do I need to do this? Gives an opportunity to that local program officer trying to figure out something for their district. Gives an opportunity for that program officer at a national level. And even people working in the ministries of finance, education, thinking around what is it that we can do to accelerate reduction in maternal and, uh, and neonatal mortality. It brings each one of us together under one platform with one ultimate goal, and that is to accelerate reduction in maternal and neonatal mortality. Next slide. I talked about knowing what it is that needs to be done. And I think the time is now that we focus on the high burden areas. We know that with public health approaches, you have 25% reduction in neonatal mortality. And if you add obstetric and basic essential neonatal care, like feeding, warmth, hygiene, you add that to 50% reduction. But unless you introduce comprehensive neonatal intensive care, you will not get to the 75% uh, uh, reduction. And we're so excited that WHO launched the standards of care for the small and sick newborn, and we think all oh, this is coming together and the Align platform will just bring everybody together to accelerate the movement in terms of implementation of inter interventions that actually work. I'm going to hand over to my co-chair, Anshu, that will talk through the global aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Quinn. I'm going to introduce the second chair, Dr. Anzu Banerjee, who is the Director of Maternal, Newborn, Child and Adolescent Health and Aging at the WHO. And he is previously someone who has coordinated work in the office of the Assistant Director General for Family, Women and Children Health at the WHO in Geneva. And he is here today to speak with us and also give us encouragement and provide leadership in this new initiative. Over to you, Dr. Banerjee. Thank you very much. And I will try to uh, um, compliment uh, Queen uh, on her 
a, a complementary presentation from a country perspective with a couple of slides from a global perspective and a global overview on maternal and newborn uh, care. Next slide. So first of all, um, we always want to talk about the mother-baby diet. And I think it's very important that we look at these two interlinked and that we don't differentiate or we don't separate the mother from the baby. And I hope that this picture is really highlighting why we have the Align m &H, uh, um, concept, let's say. It's really around keeping, making sure that we have the mother and the baby together. Next. And first of all, maybe just uh, some statistics around maternal mortality. We know that there is a decline. Uh, we have seen uh, progress during the MDG era. But if we want to achieve the SDG goal for maternal mortality by 2030, we are off track. And I think that's a very important message to put out here. We, say we have 10 years to go. Uh, but if we continue with the current decline in uh, mortality reduction, then we will not achieve the SDGs. Next. And at the same time, as Queen has also shown, we know where maternal mortality takes place. At the moment, we have around 295 maternal deaths a year, and they take place particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Southeast Asia. And so it's important that we really focus on how we can support these countries to move forward. Next. Similarly, for new, neonatal or newborn mortality, we know that at the moment it's almost 50% of under five mortality. So the number of children that die in their first month of life is almost the same as the number of children that die within their first five years of life. And so this is an important period, a very delicate period, let's say, for the child that we really need to invest in and address. We have seen a decline. The decline has been slower than for uh, under five mortality in general. And that's why we have at the moment 50% of deaths under five in this population group of the first month of life. Next. And we don't only have a high mortality rate amongst newborns. We also have nearly 2 million babies who are stillborn every year. And as Queen has just shown, most of these interventions that can save newborns and um, and prevent stillbirths are actually around that first day of life. And so it's very important that we do not forget when we talk about mortality, that there are also 2 million stillborn babies um, and, and uh, every year. So three quarter of those stillbirths are actually happening again in the same region, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Southeast Asia. And we have huge discrepancies or disparities between the countries. And if we look at the the country where we have the highest stillborn rate and the um, lowest stillborn rate, we see that there is a 23-fold difference between that. And this is totally unacceptable that in this day and age that we have so many inequities depending on where you are born. Next. So um, I would like to now highlight something around coverage of services and pr uh, provision of services. Next slide. So when we look at um, a number of the interventions that are lagging behind, particularly for newborn as well, we see that, for example, um, breast, um, exclusive breastfeeding is still less than or around 50%, and initiating breastfeeding is also um, uh, around 50%, so early initiation of breastfeeding. So we see that there are still very cost-effective interventions that we need to scale up and that we need to communicate um, to both mothers, parents, healthcare workers to put emphasis on in order to improve uh, the, the lives and well being of small newborns and um, prevention of their deaths. Other interventions that are still low are, for example, postnatal care, uh, both for the mother and the baby. Next slide. And at the same time, again, if we look at quintiles, we also see that we have inequities uh, between uh, income groups. So for example, antenatal care, um, the coverage can vary between 40 to more than 80%, depending on what the, um, uh, the, the wealth is of that particular household. And again, this is totally unacceptable. We need to make sure that every mother during her pregnancy has access to antenatal care 
um, and uh, can benefit from that in order to prevent stillbirths, to prevent eclampsia, to prevent uh, other conditions, in order also uh, to have a healthy, new, um, a healthy birth and that the newborns can have uh, the best start at life. Next. And the other issue that's important and also highlighted by the minister earlier is the issue of quality of care. Quality of care can prevent 1 million newborn deaths a year and can prevent 50% of maternal deaths a year. So uh, the next slide just highlights really what the issue is at the moment. We have been able, next slide, we have been able to um, increase access to services, um, but what we are really struggling with now is the, is the quality of the services. And this can be either because the um, uh, consumables are not there, it can be because the health workforce is not there, it can be because the health workforce doesn't have the uh, competencies to provide the right quality of care, and so this needs investments. And it's important that we invest in the different health system building blocks in order to make care accessible and of quality. Next. And one other issue I want to highlight is really the issue of mistreatment. We know that many women experience mistreatment during childbirth and um, up to 40% experience physical or verbal abuse or stigma and discrimination uh, when they go for a delivery. And this doesn't, um, uh, this, this ensures that we remain with inequities and it also results in the fact that people then therefore do not want to come to health services to get antenatal care, to get um, in, interpartum care or to deliver in facilities or to even have postnatal care. And so respectful care is really a component that needs to be addressed as well. Next slide. So why do we have Align MNH? Well, we know that there is a tremendous amount of research, evidence and knowledge generation that is happening all over the world. We know that there is normative and technical guidance that comes out quite regularly. Um, it's important that we are able to advocate and advocate for resource generation. It's important that we are able to address health workforce issues. So there is a plethora of issues that we really need to look at, but we need to look at it in an integrated manner. And the platform, the Align m &H platform, will be the opportunity to look at this in a, from a more holistic perspective and be able to provide, as uh, Queen was just highlighting, uh, the right kind of guidance to the healthcare worker, the right kind of guidance to the policy maker, the right kind of interaction between different communities uh, to support the maternal newborn health agenda and the right kind of interaction uh, in order to implement and accelerate the, uh, <clears throat> the scale up of knowledge and evidence into practice and implementation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anshu, for that uh, presentation, reminding us that it's it's not just the structural factors that affect and negatively affect the lives of mothers and newborns, but also interactional matters, the way we relate to one another in these settings. And also reminding us that the first day of life is equally important and that we cannot forget about stillbirths as we try to deal with the problems relating to maternal and newborn health. And also, thank you, Queen, because you have indicated that there are many challenges that are being faced by various health systems and that there are interventions that have worked, that continue to work, and that what we are now having in the form of Align m &H will be part and perhaps a big part of the solution to the problems that we are having. Thank you very much. Among ourselves, we have the company 
of two other important speakers. And the two important speakers are Dr. Emmy and Miss Kate Crawford. Dr. Emmy Pollock is a director of maternal, newborn and child health at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And she is a director there. She leads teams, including the strategy team on MNCH and also on nutrition and family planning. And after her, we are going to have Miss Kate. And Miss Kate Crawford is with USAID. She is a director in the Office of Maternal Child Health and Nutrition at USAID in the US. Over to you, colleagues. Emmy, you are muted. Please, please unmute yourself. Can you hear me? We can hear you now, thank you. I'm sorry. Um, so let me begin by thanking the steering committee members, uh, our JAPAIGO and USAID colleagues, uh, and all of you joining us today virtually from around the world. Um, and I know it's uh, morning, afternoon, and evening for many of you, so thank you so much for making the effort to be here with us as we uh, kick off uh, Align MNH. It's because of your work that we've made major advances in maternal and newborn health in recent decades. And, uh, and I refer back to Queen's comments as a clinician and uh, a person who has so much hands-on and direct uh, understanding of the risk uh, for both mothers and for small and sick newborns. Uh, and to Anshu for setting the stage with data today. There remains a lot more that we can do to improve the situation that we're in. And we feel that we can accelerate the future progress by more effectively coming together as a united team on maternal and newborn health in the community. Uh, we can maximize time, attention, resources of our communities when the mother and the newborn dyad is the focus of our work. And we've seen cases where viewing the mother and baby together as a dyad is essential and has helped us make incredible progress. For example, we know that maternal anemia is a serious global health problem affecting about 40% of pregnant women worldwide that has adverse outcomes for both mothers and babies. Mothers are at increased risk for postpartum hemorrhage, for preeclampsia, for postpartum depression and even mortality. And maternal anemia also impacts, impacts perinatal and newborn outcomes, such as poor fetal growth, stillbirth, low birth weight, and limited immune system and neurocognitive development. When we don't address anemia in pregnancy, we perpetuate the substantial intergenerational risk of anemia in mothers delivering weak and anemic children who struggle to achieve their potential and subsequently become uh, anemic mothers as the cycle continues. If we think of them together as a dyad of complementary needs, we can interrupt the cycle by effectively addressing anemia prior to and during pregnancy through better prevention, screening, detection, and treatment. And thinking, them, thinking of them together, we can improve the lives of both the women and her uh, and her baby. We all know what the consequences are of an unhealthy mother delivering a baby and then at risk for a second follow-on pregnancy straight after that. And anemia is one of the ways that we can address this high-risk problem along with attention to family planning and birth spacing. Stillbirths, uh, really another example of where it's imperative that we view the mother and baby as a dyad. And the development of the use of data has pointed us in this direction. We had a huge initiative over the last year or two to establish standardized, consistent definition with many of our partners in the global community. 
so that we can use stillbirth not only as uh, as a marker, we can measure it accurately, but we can use it as an indicator of how we are doing to improve the quality of care, particularly intrapartum, when we see fresh stillbirth as that indicator for a failed event intrapartum. This will help us address and prevent the more than 2 million late pregnancy and intrapartum stillbirths that occur globally, 82% of which are in low-income countries. And finally, kangaroo mother care, this incredible opportunity such a simple intervention that we need so much more of is a low-cost, high-impact intervention. It improves the survival of preterm newborns by 40%, and we have new data that shows that, and reduces the infection rate by 44%. It's also associated with decreased postpartum depression in mothers. Even still, global coverage, as we've heard from Anshu in his last remarks, remains low. As with anemia, we need to approach interventions with both mothers and babies in mind, together, in order to maximize their benefit. These are examples of why the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is committed to working with maternal newborn health communities as one dedicated community, clear in its vision and united in its purpose, speaking the same language, using the same data, and working within the same system to develop a common voice. We believe that the new Align MNH platform will help guide us all towards this vision by making a different approach. It will be driven by country priorities. It will prioritize the mother-baby dyad and bring together the maternal, perinatal, and newborn health communities for the first time really in a large format. And hopefully soon we'll be able to get together to really share and mingle our common stories and efforts to change the trajectory of mothers and newborns' lives. It will focus on science, and it will bring together scientists, innovators, researchers, and practitioners. Managers and policymakers will drive maternal, perinatal, and newborn science, research, and implementation experience. Evidence to policy is our goal, and we want to see all of the evidence together for that dyad to maximize our efforts. Align MNH will build from the great work and knowledge sharing that's already happening in different communities and provide a common platform and meeting space for exchanging information on best practices, guidelines, advocacy tools, and communities of practice. It will proactively share evidence and know-how with MNH technical working groups in countries. And lastly, Align MNH will provide a forum for tracking key MNH metrics such as ENAP and EPMM targets agreed upon by countries across the globe. We're thrilled to be here with you for this occasion and look forward to a promising a 10-year partnership in unifying the maternal and newborn community. Thank you so much for being here today. Over. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's a privilege to be a part of this Align MNH launch this morning in such an esteemed, uh, with such an esteemed group of experts and technical leaders. I, uh, Dr. Banerjee and Dubé and Dr. Polak have all mentioned some of the sort of clinical and data issues. Put put them out well. So I'm going to just spend a little time on speaking to how USAID is positioning itself to be a partner in accelerating um, advances in maternal, newborn, and um, child, child health in the next five to 10 years. I think uh, previous speakers have spoken to incredible successes as well as underscored the need for the collective intensive efforts to accelerate progress. So indeed our data call this year for the USAID annual acting on the call report, which is really our report to the US Congress primarily, revealed that although a number of our partner countries, these are our priority MNCH countries, are on track or require only small accelerations to achieve targets 
for maternal and newborn mortality, progress has stalled and is backtracking in a number of our priority countries. You know, our analysis is some of these countries must double or in some cases triple current rates of progress to improve the trajectories for maternal and newborn survival. And as Dr. Dubé uh, referred to, this is a somewhat unrealistic challenge uh, taking 100 plus years uh, without uh, and, and speaks to the critical need for new, uh, better aligned country driven solutions, commitment, and leadership. So we look forward to the partnership in Align MNH. Uh, I will say briefly we're entering a new political period here in the United States. Uh, but that said, USAID remains very committed to working in partnership with uh, the public and private sectors of our partner countries, as well as many of the organizations and partners uh, on, in this meeting. In the next five years, we will focus on adopting more stratified and targeted approaches, both nationally and subnationally. I know Dr. Uh, Banerjee spoke to the inequities. Not only are there inequities among countries, but huge inequities within countries. Uh, and we will also highlight and focus on quality of care and respectful care. Uh, Oh, to this end, we have recently designed and launched a suite of awards, which we refer to as the, Mom the Momentum Awards. I'm sorry. Uh, and the idea is this is the first time that maternal, newborn, child, health, nutrition, uh, reproductive health, family planning have mingled uh, money and design and management of these awards globally to better reflect integration at the country level. Uh, these are a coordinated suite of six awards. I will just very briefly speak to them. There is a specific award looking at integrated health resilience, which aims to support health systems and health delivery for maternal, uh, for women, children, and newborns in fragile settings. There's the Country and Global Leadership Award of which Japigo is the prime. Uh, this is focused on targeted technical assistance and capacity building. There's a private health sector award. There's a safe surgery in family planning and obstetrics award. There's a routine immunization an equity award, and there is lastly the Knowledge Accelerator, which really is an award to, to pull together the monitoring and evaluation, knowledge management, and strategic <laughs> communications across all the awards. So again, this is the first time we've done this integrated approach. It is really intended to help us focus, stratify, and and uh, accelerate to accelerate all of the maternal, newborn, and child uh, targets. Uh, again, as I said, our Momentum Country and Global Leadership Project is led by JAPIGO. This aims to elevate and leverage the expertise, leadership, and capacity of country voices to advance global learning, evidence, policy, and program decision making. And JAPIGO is indeed our partner. It's our partner instrument in this Align m &H effort. Uh, Align's thoughtful approach to bringing together maternal, perinatal, and newborn health networks represents concerted effort to harmonize the historic silos that have persisted in this community. And we look forward to breaking those down. We also look forward to working um, together to better align donors, researchers, practitioners, policymakers behind country efforts, to better use data and data analytics to move policy and budgets, and to flip uh, what, what we're seeing increasingly as a somewhat stale development approach and ensuring that country experts and expertise are pushing and leading these efforts. So I I wanna thank you again for inviting me uh, and USAID is a very committed partner. We look forward to working closely with all of you in the next five to 10 years. And um, I wish, I wish uh, Align m &H well in its future endeavors. Thank you.
Over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmy and Kate. Thank you for this informative remarks and also for your organization's commitment and resources to this important initiative, this important investment and for the period that has been indicated. Now, I think we're going to have a little bit um, of some, uh, we are going to have a presentation in the form of a video. And this is a testimonial from one of our Align MNH Steering Committee representatives, Professor Hadisa Galadansi. We are going to watch the video from her. Thank you very much. This video represents one of the country voices that we'll be hearing and sharing this afternoon, this morning. Can, can we hear the video, please? We're all aware that countries, especially uh, the middle income uh, countries are struggling and are not on track uh, to achieve the goals and the targets that we've set uh, for SDG3. Uh, there is need for countries to accelerate their efforts in trying to achieve uh, the targets and the goals. And for countries to achieve that, uh, there is need for them to harness all the support uh, that is required uh, for them to complement their efforts so that at the end of the day they can achieve the uh, goals and the target of SDG 3. Uh, some countries have established the National uh, Reproductive Health Working Group uh, and this group uh, assist, provides technical assistance to the Federal Ministry of Health as well as coordinate the activities of the many stakeholders and actors that are in reproductive maternal uh, newborn arena. Uh, the National Reproductive Health Working Group uh, should um, collaborate and partner with Align MNH uh, so that they can accelerate their efforts towards achieving the goals and the target. Uh, the knowledge hub uh, that is provided uh, by Align MNH uh, provides countries with resources uh, so that they can learn evidence-based interventions that are really providing results and leading to reduction in maternal mortality, uh, neonatal morbidity and mortality. They will also have lessons that are learned from other countries and importantly they will know about implementation strategies of the many interventions that are available in reproductive, maternal, newborn uh, health. All this effort is for us to be able to achieve the targets and the goals that we set for ourselves before 2030. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is very helpful, Professor Hadisha. We are at a point now where we are going to turn to the other members of the steering committee. Professor Hadisha and Dr. Queen and Dr. Anshu work with other members in this steering committee and they, we have them as country panel members who are going to 
present this morning, this afternoon. And I'm going to ask each speaker to briefly introduce themselves uh, in one or two sentences and also share with us why do you think this is the moment, this is the time, why now for this investment and how is it different? And perhaps how does it complement other efforts within the global m and community? What can we learn from one another to further the goal of m and uh, globally? Thank you very much. Over to you, country panel members. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Aparajita. Good morning, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, I work at the Center for Catalyzing Change in India, and I also coordinate uh, the White Ribbon Alliance uh, for Safe Motherhood in India. And I think it's really, really important. Uh, our moderator asked us why now. I think if not now, then when? So today, as we walk with the SDGs as our North Star, and as estimates tell us, and as other speakers have mentioned, many countries will need, at the very least, to double the current uh, efforts, to double the current rate of uh, reduction to ensure progress towards SDG, and action needs to happen on the ground. And that's why we are here, and that's why Align MNH. Thank you. Thank you very much. Over to you, David. May you share your thoughts, please? Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Dr. David Hirushwa. I'm an obstetrician and gynecology at University Teaching Hospital of Chigari. So um, also as a clinician uh, who have been dealing with uh, women and neonatal health, neonatal health for the last eight years, I'm really very pleased to, to see this initiative coming because we have to act now. We know that with SDG, we remain with only 10 years. And... Uh, it is quite important that we understand that it's unacceptable that women lose their life while they are trying to give birth. Or they give birth to a baby who is not going to survive and live at least the first anniversary. So I think this is the right moment, this is the right time to measure our progress and then see how we can meet the SDG, which is quite important for the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Samba. Please, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, bringing implementation research data, uh, uh, science and program experiences together to translate the action at the, the country level is, is necessary uh, to, to spear action to at the uh, uh, country level. So I really, I'm so happy and then and, and, and really uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to, to, to everyone. Uh, thank you uh, so much for inviting me to, to attend this really important event. It has been a fantastic, uh, a fantastic to listen to all of the speakers and, and to see uh, the patience uh, that uh, we all have to ensure that uh, there is accelerated progress to our uh, improved maternal, perinatal, newborn outcomes and ensure uh, women and newborn survives and, and thrives, especially now. Uh, I, I have spent my, my career not just uh, promoting and, and carrying out research, uh, but also ensuring that research is translatable uh, for the political changes. It is not enough. Uh, to have research driven by a global agenda if it is not context appropriate. In the same way, it is not enough to have great research which available and, and accessible to policymakers. So um, I have seen over the course of my career that the value of translating evidence-based research into effective policymaking is increasing, recognized and understood 
both uh, from the ground up and top down. We use the word translation to describe the mobilization of knowledge into policy. But we need to be careful. This word is, this word in its literal uh, sense uh, can obscure the complex reality of the relationship between the world and the world of research and policymaking. So as an ex-Minister of Health, I know the demands and difficulties of the job where you are having uh, to make high level, often economically as well as data uh, driven decisions. I also have been in the field, um, you know, a field worker uh, on, on the ground. And, and now uh, the difficulties faced uh, uh, there too, and often uh, the, the, the chasm uh, between the chasm between uh, the two roles and, and their mutual understanding can grow too wide. So I believe it, it can be uh, bridged uh, by high quality ongoing communication. I still spend a large uh, proportion of my time in the field talking to people, communities, village chiefs, healthcare workers, and all level being close to field worker uh, allow me to really understand what critical gaps and, and what um, say, say, as scientists we should be addressing so those gaps can be addressed. It, it is also our responsibility to ensure that those gaps and the evidence around how to address them uh, are well communicated uh, to the policymakers. As researchers aiming uh, to enhance knowledge translation, we need to be aware of factors influencing the demand for different type of research, interact and work closely with key policy uh, uh, stakeholders, networks and local champions and knowledge, uh, 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 acknowledge the roles of important interest uh, groups. Too much time uh, has been wasted uh, between evidence being produced and policy change in the past time which cannot, uh, which we cannot afford uh, any longer. Communication is the key. Uh, one of the issues I have seen in the last three months in Mali out, out in the field is that essential health services have been shattered by COVID-19. And it, it worries me the impact that will have on, on maternal and neonatal health. So then we must work stronger, uh, more collaboratively, and more smartly to ensure that we do not lose the progress we have made and do get to reach uh, the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Samba. Please share your thoughts with us, Dr. T. Thank you so much, Mukhanto. Um, I'm joining in from Johannesburg in South Africa. And South Africa is a middle income country. One where, in fact, when you look and you compare with the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa, our GDP is higher, but we also spend more on health per person than any other country on the continent. And our healthcare is supposed to be free for all people who are living in South Africa, including those who are pregnant. And yet, despite all of this money that is being spent on programs around maternal health and childbirth, we don't quite yield the desired outcomes or results when it comes to the um, ending deaths around maternal and childbirth. And it's also important um, to talk about, you know, the data that has been coming through from the South African National Committee on Confidential Inquiries into maternal deaths. And it was suggesting at the time, and this is still true today, that up to 44% of maternal deaths could be attributed to HIV and AIDS. And it's actually quite a dire situation if you think about all of the medical and the biomedical advancements and technologies and the availability of treatment of HIV. And yet, despite all of those rollouts, we still see the impact of HIV. It's also important for me to highlight why this issue of maternal and newborn health is a human rights issue. 
When I'm wearing my other cap as the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right to Health, as well as a commissioner for, on, on the Commission for Gender Equality, it's important to remind us all that the intersection between the high levels of gender-based violence and sexual violence and rape in South Africa, as well as the high numbers of women who then later on acquire HIV because they are a survivor of rape, and how then the clinical condition then leads them and makes them in a more makes them um, a more vulnerable um, to dying and, and having um, you know, maternal um, complications. And so this is why Align MNH is very important. It's very timely in all of our efforts and, and in our collaboration and partnerships to work outside of the silos and the different themes, but to really reintegrate sexual and productive health rights as, as an integral part of the right to health and most importantly, that will yield positive health outcomes. And it's very important to talk about the different human rights that are important that need to be affirmed. And we know that the delay in accessing care is a high, it's a big problem for, for, for many countries, whether it's antenatal care, whether it's people who have decided that they don't want to carry a pregnancy to term and require safer methods of termination, or again, in labor. We know that the delays in seeking appropriate medical care contribute to um, high levels of death. We know that the delays in reaching appropriate health facilities continue to be a problem, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, where you have many rural women who still need access to more of the Western type of health care, when especially the indigenous health or the more traditional health practitioners are unable to assist them. And of course, we know that delays, even when people have reached the healthcare facility, sometimes there are delays in them getting the right care. And we know the unfortunate situation of obstetric violence, where women uh, experience discrimination, as well as some rights violations while they are giving birth. So it's very important to talk about um, the project Align MNH within the context of the Sustainable Development Goals and locate this work within a human rights perspective and a framework, because I think that is what will give all of us a collective vision and a mission when we are working to promote and to protect the rights of women and children. And this way, we can take a big step to ending gender inequality and in fact, promoting the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of both physical and mental health. Wow. Thank you. Wow, wow, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this impressive insights that you have provided. Thank you, Aprajita, David, Samba, and Daleng. This is great. This is the kind of knowledge that we need for this community. And as Align MNH is going forward, we need this kind of technical knowledge to support the intervention itself. And at this point, I want to indicate that there are lots of questions that are emanating from when we started this session. And there will still be questions as we proceed this afternoon, this morning. And I have many questions that I would like to ask our panelists. And we know that it will not be fair that I'm the only one posing those questions. At this point, I would like to kindly solicit the audience to help us here, to help us in terms of identifying what they think will be the top three questions that they would like the panel to respond to. And this will be during the country panel discussions that we are going to have. We have five questions and we're going to run a poll. We're going to run a poll where we are asking you to identify those 
top three questions. And according, depending on how you respond, uh, we are going to ask our panelists to respond to those questions. And the hosts and the panelists cannot vote. So it's only our invited guests that will be uh, voting. And we are asking them to indicate, we have five questions. The first question of the poll is, how do we ensure that the efforts of Align MNH are driven by country priorities. We have had speaker from speaker indicating that this should be what guides Align MNH efforts. The second question, how do you think is different about Align MNH compared to other global or regional platforms and what gap does it feel? What gap does Align MNH feel? Third question, what are the bottlenecks in translating knowledge to practice or translating evidence to action? The fourth question, what can we learn from other communities, other communities of practice such as HIV, immunization and others in terms of shared learning platforms to inform the Align MNH approach. Lastly, how do we position MNH amidst a sea of considerations as countries work towards primary health care and achieving universal health coverage? So these are the five questions, and we would like to see how we think about them and what we think should be prioritized. And I will be asking our panelists to respond to these questions. We have the results. And I don't know if the, we have finished voting. Have we completed the poll or are the results still com, coming in? The poll has ended. Is it complete? Can I go ahead because we have the results? Yes. And the first question that I'm going to pose, thank you very much. I'm going to ask Dr. Aparajita to respond to this one. What do you think is different about Align MNH compared to other global or regional platforms? And what gap does it fill? Over to you. Thank you, uh, moderator. I just want to preface my remarks before I directly respond to that question. I think uh, why MNH platform today is uh, needed and why uh, it should be different is also based on what is happening today. Uh, so even before the pandemic, as you heard from various speakers, we had too many maternal newborn child deaths, but we have to recognize that COVID-19 has really dealt a blow to the progress so far. Uh, already strained health systems are being overstressed, there are disruptions being caused, and we have to be cognizant of the fact that this could increase uh, preventable maternal newborn child deaths, mortality and morbidity. We have to recognize today that even a modest decline in service provision could result in increased maternal newborn deaths and millions of unintended pregnancies if family planning services are disrupted. So why now, why Align MNH? That's uh, one point that I have. The other thing that I want to talk about really is that, you know, in the 1990s, when we saw improvement uh, in reduction of maternal newborn child deaths, uh, we know the growing economies were the fulcrum for this reduction. Now, because of COVID-19, economies globally, nationally are taking a beating. And we have to do all we can to ensure that the infrastructure, the referral system, the care systems, which, is, which was set up in 
growing economies now do not slip back. So that is really why it is important that you know we look at what we can do, uh, how what we can do differently. Now coming to your question, I mean, I would respond in terms of how I would like to see this platform as different. I think often when we talk of uh, strategies, investment solutions, we do take a very, very vertical approach. But I think COVID has shown us that when we are designing solutions, we have to design solutions that are context specific. We have to look at intersectionality and COVID-19 has made this so, so very visible. So I hope that uh, this particular platform will help uh, people have access to know-how, to knowledge, to guidance, really to address health, economy, social, and other needs of people who really bear the intersectional brunt of you know, basic structural in inequality. So as we build back better, we have to take into account a range of factors, gender, age, race, access to resources, et cetera, and I'm hoping that M Align MNH platform would contribute to this critical need. The second thing that I want to uh, kind of really talk about how this platform could be different is that, and previous uh, speakers have referred to this, we know that health workers lack access to reliable information, to guidelines, and to training. And again, due to COVID, we saw that there is not enough information and data that is evidence-based or even truthful. So we need to provide access to up-to-date uh, data, up-to-date evidence. We have to provide evidence-based information, and these could be delivered uh, through platforms like Align MNH, through peer-to-peer -peer networks, or even through you know messaging apps, etc. And lastly, uh, you know, I think to me, uh, this is extremely vital that we have to keep women and communities at the center in decision making at all levels. We must ensure that the lived experiences of women and families are number one, respectfully heard, and number two, meaningfully addressed in all the response and recovery pathways that we create. Uh, our What Women Want campaign told us that even though we know that services are being struck now, but women want services that are delivered with dignity and respect, and it must be prioritized even or especially during such uncertain and stressful times. So these are some of the knowledge that we expect uh, that the MNH platform can talk about, that even if we want to increase service uptake, if we want to reduce maternal deaths, we have to look at various elements and you know, really look at uh, someone mentioned in the chat box and the Q&A box that we sh shouldn't just talk about surviving, but we have to ensure thriving. And my hope is that the Align MNH platform and all of you here today will contribute to this, uh, to this journey. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jita. Dr. T, please. I have a hand, so just repeat which question am I answering? You're answering the question, wh what do you think is different about Align, Align MLH compared to other global or regional platforms and what gap does it fill? Absolutely. Um, so I think it's very, very, very important um, to really understand the, the great work that has been done before. And the fact that when we're talking about knowledge and knowledge sharing, we really have to be intentional about ensuring that we include everyone in the chain of giving healthcare. So we have to listen to the clinicians and the healthcare providers, which is why Align MNH makes me so excited and why it's a cause that I believe in. Because very often, even as a young medical student and a young doctor, I've been very frustrated at how little our voice as clinicians, the people who are supposed to be translating policy into care, were always missing on the table and our voices were not heard. So I think this for me is really important. And this is what makes um, Align MNH really different. And I think, of course, when we're talking about the birthing process. It's also important um, to understand that MNH is creating a platform for indigenous knowledge, for people who are supporting and allied health practitioners, such as your social workers, psychologists, your birthing doulas, to be part of this knowledge sharing and this exchanging 
of information on best practice. I think what's also different about um, Align MNH is that we are taking what's existing in terms of guidelines, in terms of advocacy tools, in terms of even what we are talking about just in terms of um, you know, communities of practice and, and putting that in one space where all of us in the different regions of the world can exchange knowledge and best practice and learn from one another. And I think that's part of the big step to moving away from working in silos, not only in themes, but also in how we relate to each other as a global community in the different regions of the world. And it's about merging all of that knowledge and learning from each other and being agile in how we take on this data and the scientific knowledge and the research that we are producing to actually inform best practice and good practice in the different regions of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. T. The next question is directed to you, David. How do we position MNH amidst a sea of considerations as countries work towards primary healthcare and achieving universal health coverage? Okay, thank you so much for, for, for this question. And maybe even before I go to exactly the question, let me talk about the evidence, which is also linked to, to the primary care. Uh, we, we, we have seen recently that really there is a discrepancy between evidence-based uh, I mean, the, 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 the production of evidence and its implementation at the, the country and the facility level, so which is really a very big challenge. So, for example, in our daily practice, what we see, we see women coming with PPH because the, the first cause of maternal mortality and neonatal mortality, as you know, for women is the postpartum hemorrhage and the preeclampsia. And these things, most of the time, they start from the primary health care because women do come there and once we, they develop complication and end up by losing their life, we do a kind of maternal and neonatal audit. And most of the time we see that there was a challenge in the way they were managed. So something was not done correctly. So this is like where there is issue with the implementation of the guideline and the protocols. So it happens to all cases, to postpartum. We say postpartum. Sometimes we find out that maybe, I mean, uterotonic were not given, fluid were not given. Then at the end, we find out something wrong happened. The same thing to preeclampsia. Preeclampsia, when, when a woman dies of preeclampsia, sometimes we see that during a tenato consultation, she did not get all that she should be expecting when she come to consultation. And this, most of the time, will happen from the primary health care up. So and another challenge we see is also related to neonatal mortality because like, for example, when you look at the main cause of neonatal mortality, we have both asphyxia. And with both asphyxia, for example, we see that if monitoring of labor was following a kind of guideline was done correctly, baby should not be dying. People also see we, baby dying because they have infection or preterm delivery. Still, there is something lacking with regard to the way they babies or the mothers will manage when they are pregnant. So this lack of evidence-based implementation really leads to poor quality sometimes. So how do we, do we make sure that with Align, uh, answering to your question, that Align is going to, to help improve the primary health care, which is really the, the trend. So we know the primary health care have really a number of advantages, mainly because we see that many people get access to care when you have primary care. Then the health outcome also should be better because the, out, the access is also much improved. And also there is no much of inequality because many people will just have the same access. So what we need to do in the field of MNH, we need to make sure that the evidences which are produced because they are producing a very big number worldwide. So they should just go down and meet be implemented at the level of the primary health care. This is quite, is going to be the key to make sure that maternal and neonatal health is improved with regard to primary health care. So the other things which has to be done is just the integration. As we see a very, a very good number of uh, intervention being done at the level of the primary health care, we need to make sure that also women, ma management of women when they are pregnant or even neonates, when they come, they can even get some other services which they meet at the level of the primary health care. So this will just motivate many people, either health providers and women. 
also the education of women is going to be quite important because when you're talking about the maternal and neonatal, we put them together. A pregnant woman, when a pregnant woman is well cared, also the baby is going to be born safely. So it is quite, quite important that women get educated, get informed about the quality care which they need so that they can be able to ask for it when they come at the level of the health facility. So our efforts, the effort of MNH in sharing of information, in measuring progress, in helping policymakers at the country level have to make sure that it reaches the primary health care where the majority, where a big number of people will just be able to access the care they need. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Samba, can we hear your thoughts, please? Okay, thank you. Is that on um, uh, the questions around um, what we can learn uh, from over communities? Um, yes. yes, thank you very much. So I, I really uh, uh, echo fully uh, what have been said by previous speakers on previous questions. I completely agree with uh, all of them. I uh, just would like to say that um, uh, in terms of sharing, uh, you know, learning, learn platform and to inform um, our uh, initiative, our approach, I, I would, I, you know, what we have learned from these uh, shared learning platforms is, is the importance of community advocacy and uh, ensuring that we ensuring that the communication is strong from, from community all the way uh, to the policymakers. So communication must start always, uh, uh, it could go both directions, but the operational level, community level is really, really key uh, before it, it goes all the way up. Having context-driven um, uh, research is, is a paramount, uh, not only for policy changes, but also for uh, uh, uptake uh, by the community themselves. It is absolutely critical uh, to communicate, to operationalize our communication strategies and policies, adapt them, make them very, very digestible and understandable, simple uh, uh, to the community, by the community, and, and with the community in the community. So uh, uh, this is even true, taking into account the uh, current COVID 19 context. Uh, Rumors are, are always winning. So we, we have to be very careful and proactive. This is what I would, I would say uh, regarding that question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much. And the next question will be about bottlenecks. What are the bottlenecks in translating knowledge to practice or translating evidence to action? Can we hear? Dr. Jita, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, there are many, but I'm going to just talk about maybe two bottlenecks that we face as practitioners uh, in a country who works on the ground. I think uh, the first big bottleneck is the gap between you know, policy making and what is evidence telling us. So we have good uh, research, we have good evidence. But sometimes this is either not articulated properly or not available to policymakers. And we end up having policies which are not really evidence-based. Uh, we end up recreating the wheel. We end up uh, wasting resources and uh, we end up not really succeeding to reduce uh, mortality, morbidity, et cetera. So I think the first gap for me, the first bottleneck is that evidence research must input into policymaking. Uh, the second bottleneck that I want to talk about is really, you know, how do we, beyond policy making, how do we translate, uh, translate evidence to actual implementation on the ground? And we know as technical experts, as implementers, it is not a linear path. So what we really need to do is once we know what works, once we have a cluster of best practices, how do we ensure, how do we remove the bottleneck uh, in order to ensure that the evidence is translating into implementation on the ground. So I'm going to stop at these two because in my opinion, these are the very, very big bottlenecks and other panelists can add to this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. David, please, can we hear your thoughts about bottlenecks?
Hello, David. Hello, yes, please. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Okay, all right. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, I, I'm also in the same direction as her because there are really a very good number of challenges which are there. So I, I would say that there are some uh, challenges which are personal, especially when you go to the level of the clinician because the implementation of the, the guideline on the evidence starts from, in fact, it involves different levels. It, it, it involves the health professionals, it involves, I mean, policymakers. So, but some of the challenges, in fact, will just be found at those areas. For example, when you go to personal factors, when you go to individual clinician, you'll find that some of the clinicians do not have awareness about the evidence, which is, which is new. And sometimes when the evidence is out there, you find out that they, they are not really familiar with it. The way it is produced, it may be sometimes it is long, it is, uh, it's hard to, 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 to implement and those become a, a big challenge. However, we also see lack of skills, for example, among health providers who cannot be able to search for the available evidence. And I think this is where Align MNH is going also to be uh, very helpful. The other challenge is sometimes where we see uh, like a clinician having, wanting to rely mainly on the expert opinion. And this again affects sometimes the introduction of the new knowledge. So sometimes people want to keep doing what they have been doing. They don't want to do the new thing. So all of these things, because they don't even understand it clearly, all just because it's not easily practicable, sometimes it requires that it become contextualized. So with MNH, we hope that the issue of uh, Align MNH, the issue of accessibility might just be uh, tackled with it. And also, as we've seen, with the Align MNH, we are going to be able to have different evidences put together to make one clear evidence. So the two complex or sometimes challenge of having different type of evidence is also going to be solved by with the MNH. So that is quite going to be uh, important. So other important factor are just the external. Sometimes the evidence is out there, but it is expensive. It can't be implemented. So how do we make that financial, the, the finance which is goes to, to help make sure that some important evidence, depending on its uh, impact, can just be considered as a priority? Or how can we, or how do we make sure that if the evidence is, is very, I mean, very expensive to be achieved in our, 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 our community. How can we get an alternative, but which does similar things? Because contextualizing an evidence does not mean that you are changing the original evidence. Well, the most important is to make sure that you want the same outcome. So those are some of the, 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 the challenges, but we hope that working together with Align, we'll just be able to, 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 to reach a consensus and be able to see more women regardless of where we are, more babies, more children, regardless of where they are, they are can be managed with based on the best evidence available. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. David. We have some questions from our audience. The first one is directed to Dr. T. To what extent is quality of care focused on supporting maternal psychosocial health and particularly of young teenage mothers? I think it fits you very well, doctor, please. Absolutely. Um, I think it's very important. And this is why, you know, I always speak about locating these issues and framing them within a human rights framework and, and using human rights standards um, to influence any legislative changes or any policy updates and as well as clinical services. Many doctors and nurses don't often see how in their practice of medicine and clinical care, they can actually be promoting and protecting human rights, including the human rights of young mothers, young women who are pregnant, girls who get pregnant, often as a result of rape or as a result of the system failing to provide them critical services such as contraception and methods that are modern and that are in a different um, variety to meet the needs of young women. We also have to talk and be honest about the stigma that surrounds pregnant young learners, especially how in many countries around the world, even in the Africa region, where they still get left behind because they get kicked out of school, not only do they then deal with a pregnancy that's often as a result 
of violence or some form of discrimination and prejudice, they then also then get denied their right to education because we don't have societies and communities that understands, right, and respects the rights of young people and young girls particularly and their bodily integrity and bodily autonomy, but also punish young women who are sexually active. And that disproportionate and that um, prejudice and that dishonesty in how we view young girls who are sexually active versus what how we view young boys and young men who are sexually active, I think for me creates this cycle of stigma and shame. And this is what leads to many young women not presenting early when they think they may be pregnant. They don't get to speak to a healthcare provider who can talk to them in, in confidence and give them a whole range of options to deal with early pregnancy. And so we have to, as a public health um, community, as, as people who are dedicated to decreasing uh, mortality around maternal health, to really give young women all of the options that they need and not coerce them or force them into carrying pregnancies to term that they firstly know are unsupportable and then secondly may actually then seek unsafer ways of ending a pregnancy. And we know even in Sub-Saharan Africa, including South Africa, despite our enabling legislation as South Africa, we still have many of our maternal deaths actually as a result of death from an unsafe abortion. And so we have to talk about integrating sexual and reproductive health into all of the programming that we do because they're an integral part of the right to health. It's also important to speak and make sure that we provide continuous ethics and medical training to professionals, whether they are social workers, psychologists, nurses, um, as well as, as the doctors themselves. Because depending on where the young woman herself six K. She may be presenting to a social worker because people may view her as someone who's at risk for socioeconomic um, uh, violations or abuses or someone who's in a, a bad state in terms of um, socioeconomics. And they may present to a social worker. We need social workers too to understand the kind of psychosocial support um, that young women need. We need to end violence against women because in South Africa, we are living under the threat of rape and many of us are survivors of rape and we zero convert as a result of not having enough accessible 24 hour services that are related to post trauma support where we can get a range of sexual and reproductive health services that are accessible, acceptable, and we know the pillars of public health. The service we offer has to be available, accessible, acceptable, affordable, and of quality. And it's only when we can provide that throughout the entire reproductive cycle of young women will we reach the desired goal and the outcome of 2030. Thank you very much, Dr. T. Dr. Jita, this one is for you. The mistreatment of women during antenatal and intrapartum periods is recognized and currently receiving attention. What about newborn mistreatment? How widespread is this problem? Dr. Jita? Um, thank you, and it's extremely important question. Um, so yes, uh, I think uh, I agree that uh, mistreatment of newborns uh, may not have uh, kind of, you know, quote unquote, received uh, focus uh, till recently. But I do want to bring to your attention that if you look at the work ongoing right now uh, at global levels and also at national levels, you will see that there is complete recognition of the diet of the mother and the newborn. And there are groups of people, including the White Tribune Alliance and many others who are as part of this call, who has uh, even started by uh, kind of you know putting together an integrated charter of the rights uh, of for respectful care for the mother and the newborn. So I think it's really, really important that we do not really separate the mother and the newborn, but look at how respectful care is the right, is the entitlement of both the mother and the newborn. And we know that the spokesperson uh, for the newborn has to be among health workers, also has to be the mother and the family. So both of them needs to be looked at together and it is being looked at together. Thank you.
We have another question for Samba. Recognizing that many countries with the highest burden are countries with humanitarian and fragile contexts. How will align MNH ensure that lens is, ensure that lens is included throughout all work? There are challenges on access to care, quality data, etc., that are complicated in these settings, and dedicated action is needed. Would you comment on that, please? Thank you very much. Um, this is absolutely right. This is a great question, so practical. Um, uh, I really uh, think that uh, uh, what has been said um, is, is, is uh, very, very important. So the solutions or potential solutions using such a great initiative is to really give more energy to the whole dynamic and to, to rely on country-driven decisions and to rely on, on primary healthcare. Um, because I don't think that we will be seeing quiet countries anymore in the world. And more importantly, in uh, uh, the middle and low-income countries and the poorest among the poor is in the middle sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, there we will be seeing more and more uh, uh, issues, challenges. And for me, we should really use such a great initiative and approach to strengthen our primary healthcare system, to, to strengthen uh, the community, existing community networks. Talking about network, I'm thinking about community uh, liaisons for health activities, community uh, healthcare workers. And there is another group in our communities. They are so powerful. They, they drive uh, remorse so quickly. They can kill or expand any type of remorse so quickly. These are our community cultural leaders, social leaders, and community uh, traditional healers. Um, we all agree that uh, those guys are more and more uh, frequent in our in our country. So we need to make sure that and our private sector, we need to make sure that we involve all those in, in our initiatives and strategies and, and to, to even help us uh, 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 make our program uh, work over during crisis, crisis like COVID, crisis like political uh, 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 upheavals uh, like in my country. And, and so it is very, very important. Right now, you know, during, for example, COVID, we, we, we were re working remotely and stop house visits. These were like IRB requirements, uh, but even public health uh, is stopped in some places. So if you know you have a community system, uh, which is there, then you can use that to really maintain some of the key activities around maternal and child health. Uh, uh, more importantly, just a normal delivery, a normal ANC care, a normal postnatal care for mom and baby, a normal routine immunization uh, shot um, for us to really be able to maintain all that uh, in difficult settings, in very difficult settings. We have seen this in Ebola. We have seen this with uh, uh, very uh, uh, old endemic diseases, endemic infections like leprosy like oncocercosis, we've been working so well uh, during those days with community uh, uh, relays, community liaisons and community leaders and, 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 and uh, uh, the so-called uh, traditional birth attendants, uh, matron in French. Uh, those are to me, uh, the group of people at the operational level that we should really uh, try to think about and, and drive, direct our research activities and strategies around there and make sure that we see that if we are going to see an impact, uh, a public health impact in real life, in really places where people need this, this kind of help that will be uh, 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 at the community level. So you cannot just keep this initiative at the you know, national level research centers or sub-regional levels. 
which have to go down all the way down to work with uh, uh, community and communities and villages. For me, uh, this is key. We have to make this part of like the rock of the backbone of the primary healthcare system. Uh, it is all sick and all weak and all broken. So that's what I'm voting for. And that's what I'm, I'm, I'm really saying every day. Um, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. So. This one is for you, Dr. David. The question is, there seem to be emphasis on care during and after birth, yet more than half of still births occur during the antepatum period. How will align MNH ensure that there is equal emphasis on preventing this antepatum still births? Can you respond briefly, please? Yeah, yeah, thank you for so much, and I think that is a very great question. We've aligned MNH, and with, if we really want to, to improve our maternal and neonatal health, we need to focus not only our intervention during a pregnancy or immediate after birth, but the, or during the life course of the woman. So as we've been hearing, the challenge starts even with the reproductive health education. And the other challenge that we are seeing is, for example, in the preconception, before women get pregnant. Before women are pregnant, they already sometimes have risk factors which can lead, which can lead to, to poor neonatal outcome. Let's talk, for example, a woman with, uh, I mean, with uh, some disease, with already some disease taking medication, anti-epileptic medication. Let's talk about some women who is diabetic. Let's talk about women who really need prevention even before conception. So the interventions, as we said, with Align MNH is just to make sure that guideline and evidence-based intervention are implemented during the life course of the woman. And before pregnancy, we know the one who is going to deal with the woman is not a midwife, is not only, a, 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 I mean, uh, an obstetrician, but anyone from internal medicine, from any, any other doctor or a primary healthcare physician. So they need to get guideline and know how can we advise women to start preventing complication like a stillbirth even before conception. So during the pregnancy, the focus has to be about the antenatal consultations, the quality of antenatal consultation. We see many women coming and having one visit, one antenatal consultation, then at the end, they do not come back. So they don't come back because they didn't get what they expected, when they're they supposed to get. They are supposed to, to, to get the quality care to prevent, I mean, I mean uh, complication and make sure that they also avoid cases like stillbirth. So I agree with you. So the intervention, the guideline have to, call, to focus on the life course, preconception, during pregnancy, after pregnancy, and even between the two pregnancies where the family planning will come to, to, to reduce, the, to, to increase the, the pregnancy interval to avoid, for example, small babies. We know that there are studies showing that with short interpregnancy interval, the woman is going, is going to risk her baby. So all of those interventions will have to focus Thank there you. and we have to get clear guidelines. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We have time for the last video that is going to be shown about mother's voices. And then we can have closing remarks by Dr. Patrick Kuma Abuegi. Thank you very much. Families around the world want their sons and daughters to grow up healthy and with access to opportunities. My name is Bimla Chaudhari. My name is Bimla Chaudhari. My name is Shudhi Chachori Chhe, 10 Maina Ko. Samaj Chani, Samaj Chhe Apani Gaur Chani, Sarsa Phai Ma Mali Shikha Ko Kura, Mali Shikhi Ra Ko Kura, Sarsa Phai Ma Pani Dhyan Ule Shikha Ho Chhe Lak Chhe. Mere Anju Naam Hai, Ar Do Mere Bacche Hai. Mere Beti Tien Saal Ke Hai, Ar Mere Beti Dhai Maine Ke Hai. Mere Ko Ma Padhana Dikhana Chahati Hai, Ar Maast Achche Sre Bani. हमारे नाम चंद्रगोति रोबिदाश। आमी तो नाश्ते पाल लाम ना, तार पड़ो आमर एक टीम या शर पड़े, आमर शॉपनो आवार होलो, जामे आमर में के भालो करे लेखा पड़ा शिक्ये, नाश होग, डॉक्टर होग, जिए कुनो लाइने आमी ताके दीबो, शेटा आमर शॉपनो। To improve health outcomes for women and children, we need to better understand the experiences of women and their families at the country level. 
and ensure health information is useful, timely and actionable. We need to facilitate sharing knowledge among and across countries and ensure life-saving information is available to drive decisions and action. Join Align MNH for a decade of collective action for the health and well-being of mothers and newborns. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Day. Thank, yeah. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Good afternoon all for this exciting um, session. I am pleased to wrap up this launch event as a member of the Alliance for MNH Steering Committee. As we learn today, if you have to meet the SDGs, ERA targets, in maternal and newborn health, the MNH community must come together now and not only to come, but come the challenges presented by COVID-19, but also accelerate the progress towards improving health outcomes. The Align MNH platform, driven by country priorities, the full country-led coordinated action, financing, tracking of progress, and mutual accountability to drive progress towards SDG era targets in maternal and newborn health. The Align MNH builds, manage, builds on existing network initiatives, amplifying them and shining a light on country efforts. Collectively, we can build a better understanding of what works and how we can hasten progress. The Align MNH platform will promote these prior opportunities to identify and characterize effective high impact interventions discuss barriers to scale up and develop solutions. Challenges to achieving SDG era targets, such as financial barriers and loss of skilled health workers to urban areas and high income countries are not limited to MNH, but extend throughout the healthcare system. As we know, COVID-19 has redirected attention and resources to disaster response rather than the ongoing need for health system strength. In many of our countries, fewer people are seeking healthcare services, including antenatal care immunization, which has serious repercussions for health overall. Health system strengthening is a critical component of universal health coverage. Align MNH will provide opportunities to share evidence and programmatic experience across and within countries So we can track and accelerate progress, as well as celebrate progress. The MNH community must align around critical issues to reduce maternal and newborn mortality and morbidity and prevent stillbirths worldwide. As you are aware, Align MH will bring together global expertise and best practices with, with country level programs, implementation, and promote opportunities to share what worked and how. The MNH community can use the platform to debate and discuss context specific strategies and solutions and to galvanize action globally and within countries to accelerate, accelerate improvements in MNH. Countries and other stakeholders will share learning that is actionable and acceptable to guide program implementation. Align MNH will work in close collaboration with Momentum Country and Global Leadership to provide focused technical assistance to national stakeholders to plan, course correct, and drive action. There are upcoming events that I think we use this platform to share. And I'm pleased to announce several upcoming events being led by the Align MNH in collaboration with many partners. Please. Join us for the Global Maternal Newborn Health Virtual Summit to be held over a course of two and a half days on, the, on April 21st and 22nd, 2021, from 8 to 12 p.m. Eastern Time. Topics to be discussed include health system strengthening, quality of care, measurement, accountability, and obviously COVID-19. The summit will be 
solution focus, feature plenary and concurrent panels, and live opportunities as well as on this on the theme topic and speakers will be shared soon along with a link to register and join us. We are also excited to announce the International Maternal Newborn Health Conference, IMNHC, which will be held on April 4th to the 7th, 2022 in Cape Town, South Africa. This conference will focus on science, will be a focus on science, and the conference will convene more than a thousand maternal and newborn health stakeholders, scientists, researchers, practitioners, and policymakers from around the world. It will lead with evidence and conclude plenary presentations, skills workshops and marketplace and country exchanges, as well as opportunities for virtual exchange engagement. Increased transparency and accountability at the global and regional levels starts. IMNH will build on the latest successes in knowledge sharing already taking place and will create another space for exchange on best practices, guidelines, and advocacy tools. In all these things, we have to have a call for action. And as I conclude, it will help us to set the stage for a decade of continued learning and collective action to drive progress for maternal and newborn health and well-being. Join the collective action. This is the Align MNH Knowledge Hub at www align.mnh.org. Follow the Align MNH on social media at Align MNH. Sign up for the Align MNH mailing list and community for MNH experts. Let me say, on behalf of the Align MNH steering committee, I would like to thank our esteemed speakers for sharing their knowledge and learning with all that all of us today. As Nazim rightly said in the, his highly and moving performance, he got a line, an align for mothers in their responses, their newborn. Thank you very much. And I wish you have a wonderful uh, day and uh, thanks for this wonderful experience. Today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Patrick. We have come to the end of our program and we would like to thank everyone, to thank the presenters. Thank you very much. And if we can hear Nazim again, please. Progress is still not enough now. Mothers and newborns suffering oh, needlessly. Weak economy and poverty and poor quality care. But we are not alone in being. We have got to align, align for mothers and the newborns. We have got to align, align for mothers and the newborns. This decade is the time for learning and time for sharing. Collective action is the only way we can achieve this. We have got to align, align for mothers and the newborns. We have got to align, align for mothers and the newborns. 
Yeah. 